If you uh, have a Bible and you want to follow the reading this morning, we're going to read from uh, 1 Samuel in just a few moments. And uh, we're going to read the whole of chapter 1 uh, to start with. Um, if you want to see uh, what something is made of, um, you need to apply a little pressure. I've got a picture to show you. This is a, this is a great car. <laughs> Anybody have one of these? This was my first car. Not exactly this one. This is a, I couldn't find a picture. It was before digital cameras, so I'd, I've got some pictures somewhere, probably of my original one, but this is the same color as my car. And I was talking with my dad the other day about, uh, about how cars don't seem to rust like they used to. Uh, and maybe it's just that we're not buying the old bangers that, that we once had like this one. It was, it was pretty old when I bought it, and that was quite a long time ago. But when you bought a car of a certain age, um, you couldn't be quite sure if the bodywork was good or not, uh, whether it was solid metal or whether it had somebody had filled it in and just painted it, or worse, if it was just a layer of paint over rust underneath and uh, all the metal had gone. But if you applied some pressure, it it sometimes didn't need very much pressure, you could find out what what the thing was made of. You could find out, you could press it, especially bits down here were very susceptible. And it might look fine, but if you just poked it a little bit and and the your finger went through or the screwdriver went through, you'd know what it was made of. You'd know that it wasn't all it seemed to be. And what's true of uh, the metal on old cars like this one is is true of other things, isn't it? Uh, Wood that has been left out in the weather. Some of our fences in our garden are looking a a little bit worse for wear at the moment. Um, I was thinking, as I was thinking of this, um, there's a lovely walk from Tondi uh, through the forest uh, to Park Slip, which is a sort of converted uh, nature reserve now where it once was a mine. And, and there's one section of that walk that goes over a really boggy piece of ground. And uh, so somebody built a, a wooden boardwalk across it um, to stop your feet getting wet. But And before lockdown, I haven't been there fairly uh, very recently, but before lockdown, it was hit and miss whether the boards that you were walking on were going to take your weight, because quite a few of them had cracks or had disappeared because someone had put some pressure on them and the boards hadn't survived. They'd gone through. You knew what the plank was made of. It had rotted through and a bit of pressure uh, showed you what it was really made of. What's true of cars and what's true of bits of wood is the same of people, isn't it? I think in some ways. What are we really like? What kind of uh, character do we possess? What are we really made of? Well, apply some pressure and you will see. Uh, Put someone under pressure, stretch them a little bit, put them to their limits, stress their patience and their composure and usually their true colors will shine through what's what's there you can keep it hidden for a while but when you put a bit of pressure on you can see what's really underneath and um we're we're working through our way through a series at the moment on women of faith in the bible we're looking at some of these uh, characters in the bible and uh, today's woman of faith deserves to be a well-known story i don't know if you know the story or not but she is certainly a woman under pressure and what shows through as she is put under pressure is her godly character Uh, She is faithful, she is sacrificial, her character is sweetened by her faith and trust in God, even when she is under quite a lot of pressure, and we'll see that as we go on this morning. Her life is is full of quite a lot of bitterness to her, but she doesn't lash out at others, and she doesn't lash out at God or run from him, but rather she runs to God. It causes her to turn afresh to God, and she finds God to be her rock and her strength and her song, even, and her delight and her salvation and so we're going to we're going to turn to our attention to hannah this morning and we're going to find in her a godly example for us here's my uh, points this morning i'm going to tell you them up front uh, today uh, hannah's example for us uh, of godly suffering um of serious prayer as she turns that suffering motivates her to pray um she is our example in the way that she receives gracious answers to that prayer And uh, then as she responds to God's kindness, the costly service that she gives. And uh, finally, her joyful song. That's where we're going to go. The points are won't be equal length. Um, They will get a little bit shorter towards the end. Uh, So we're going to come back and read 1 Samuel 2 a little bit later. But I want us to read 1 Samuel 1 now and to hear God's word. And uh, let's hear the story together. So this is 1 Samuel chapter 1, reading from verse 1. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. 
Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favour in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfil his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He shall be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Amen. The story of, uh, of our example today of Hannah begins with a, a, a special kind of darkness for her. We, we are introduced to a uh, this very quickly and and simply in our story, just in verse two there. But this darkness is the backdrop to the whole of what God is going to do with Hannah and with her son. Um, look at these two verses. Um, after a little bit of info about uh, about Elkanah, uh, he's from a priestly family. He's an Israelite. Uh, but just look at verse two. He had two wives. One was called Hannah. The other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. There, there is a whole world of problems behind that little sentence there, isn't it, at the end of verse 2. Um, polygamy or, or bigamy wasn't frowned upon at that time, but it was never God's intention for, for married life. And everywhere it happens, it causes problems in the scriptures. Everywhere it takes place, you see the problems that it causes, as you can imagine. And whatever problems there might have been with a man having two wives, they were compounded here because Hannah couldn't have children and her rival Peninnah could. And that situation would have been bad enough for Hannah, um, just sharing her husband, watching, watching on as her rival succeeded where she had failed. But there was more to it than that too. Uh, Peninnah took advantage of the situation. It's probably because um, she was most likely Elkanah's second wife. Uh, Elkanah loved Hannah, maybe because of the, the fact that she couldn't have children. He had taken another wife to make sure that he had some children. And uh, we see that in other, uh, in other families in the Bible too. And Peninnah had had a revenge for not being the most loved wife, year after year after year. And then look at these verses too, to give another burden, an added burden to Hannah's situation. Look at verses 4 to 7 there. Um, they would go to uh, the temple to sacrifice uh, for the feast every year. It's probably the Passover feast. And... Um, 
Elkanah did his best to make Hannah f- uh, felt, feel special and loved by him. But look at verse 6. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. It was obvious that Elkanah had a special love for Hannah, uh, but her rival would use this uh, holy worship holiday, this what was supposed to be a joyful time, to provoke Hannah. Maybe it was to provoke Hannah to sort of to leave or something, maybe to leave the space for her uh, or to be angry at God. This annual feast was supposed to be a time of, of heightened worship and, and joy and praise and thankfulness to God. And Peninnah uses it to try and provoke Hannah uh, and to bait her repeatedly. But what we see in Hannah, and this is where we see her example, is that the suffering didn't drive her away from God, but rather it it drove her to God's throne of grace in prayer. And we'll say a bit more on that in a minute. She is is an example for us of godly suffering. She she responds to it in the right way. Um, It is interesting, we can't spend long in it, but it's interesting to note the kind of company that Hannah is in as a a childless woman uh, and a woman of faith. God had used other such women. Uh, very notably for the means of great blessing before and following her as well. So you might remember examples like Abraham's wife, Sarah, uh, and her long wait for a son, for Isaac. Also, Rebecca and her, if you look at the numbers, it seems decades long wait for for Jacob and Esau. And Rachel also had problems. uh, And only after a lot of drama did she finally bear children for for Jacob. Uh, Samson, uh, you can read about in the book of Judges, Uh, He came from uh, what was apparently a childless womb of Manoah's wife. And then when you get to the New Testament, you find uh, godly Elizabeth bears John the Baptist in her old age. So there's a there's a good there's a good uh, testimony here of the way God works. And um, I found this quote. um, Dale Ralph Davis um, is a Bible commentator and and, uh, read anything of his because it's always very thoughtful and very good and helpful. And his commentary on, on one Samuel is great. And I've got another quote later, but this is a good quote. Listen to this. God's tendency, he says, is to make our total inability his starting point. Our hopelessness and our helplessness are no barrier to his work. Indeed, our utter incapacity is often the prop he delights to use for his next act. This matter goes beyond the particular situations of biblical barren women. When his people are without strength, without resources, without hope, without human gimmicks, then he loves to stretch forth his hand from heaven. Once we see where God often begins, we will understand how we may be encouraged. That's great, isn't it? God takes what seems hopeless situations where his people can do nothing uh, to help. And uh, he uses those situations to show his, to stretch forth his hand and to show his power. And that's what he does here. So are you suffering um, under an affliction that just wears you down? Maybe there are things that nobody else knows about. Uh, Do you know this, uh, even this sorrow of heart that Hannah knew? Um, circumstances you find yourself in maybe just laying on you heavily maybe you've asked yourself in your pain why which is an obvious thing to ask now I don't think stories like this in the Bible are meant are are there to give us a sort of glib well it will be all right in the end you know don't worry about it it's not that but they are certainly there to cause you to see that God can have a higher purpose in in what you are suffering what you're going through and he cares for you deeply um, the many gospel accounts of Jesus with suffering people ought to convince you of that. But he cares. He, he's, he's, he's interested. He's bothered. Uh, Jesus suffered more than any other person to bring thank, forgiveness and salvation. And he knows and he cares. So don't let your suffering push you away from God. Rather run to the only one who truly understands and can comfort you, no matter what the outcome is. It was a good outcome here for, for Hannah, we could say. It may not be in every case. Uh, Paul suffered this pain in his body that he prayed to be released from, and it wasn't taken away. So it's not a, it's not a blank check, as it were. But there is that assurance that God knows and cares and has a purpose in what we suffer. Well, secondly, um, Hannah is an example to us of serious prayer. Serious prayer. Um, one visit to Shiloh, one annual visit, the same sorrow, the same provocation, the same weeping, the same bitterness. And it's finally the last straw for Hannah and she she leaves the family feast and she runs in bitterness of heart into the temple, which is an example of her running to God. And she brings her sorrow to the Lord. And here's our second example, serious prayer. She takes the matter to the Lord in prayer. That's a good example for us. But how she prays is is also helpful. 
how often do our um, do problems in life cause us to to go venting our anger to someone else or to everyone else uh, and not taking it to the Lord? Well, we ought to go to Him. And interestingly, um, Hannah's behaviour here and her example they shine more brightly because of the the company that she's in. The men in the story don't come out particularly well. So her husband Elkanah he. He, he does something to comfort his wife. He gives her extra portions and so on. But I kind of found myself asking, couldn't he have done a bit more to just shut penning her up, you know, to stop her from baiting uh, Hannah? And he doesn't. He doesn't seem to. Elkanah doesn't come out very well. Eli, the old priest, doesn't come out very well. And nor his sons. There's a whole world of problems there. We haven't got time to go into all of it today. But his sons were, were, uh, st- were serving in the temple. And uh, they were obviously going to take over from Eli in time. But they were wicked and ungodly men. And we'll, you'll find that out as we read on. The, uh, the priests were supposed to have some share of the offerings that people brought to live off. But they weren't supposed to serve themselves and take advantage of that. But that's what uh, these two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, did. They, they, they bullied worshippers and said, give us the best. You know, don't, 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 never mind about the rules. Just give us what we want. And they used their, their position to do that. And uh, look what it says here. In, uh, in 1 Samuel 2, this is a bit further on, you read a bit more about them in chapter 2. Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting, a place of worship of God. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. Their reputation was well known. No, my sons, it's not a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. That's it. That's his rebuke of these two men. And uh, they were famous for their wickedness. And Eli was feeble in trying to stop them. And they refused to listen to him. Maybe the way his sons were behaving with the women in the temple is the reason Eli thinks Hannah is drunk. She's probably used to seeing women in the temple like that. Um, Hannah is praying. She makes no sound. Her eyes are probably red from crying. Maybe his sight is not so great. And his judgment is already a bit suspect, we could say. And he... It's not good that he assumes the very worst of her before he even finds out uh, what's happening. It's quite shocking, really. But Hannah is an example of, of serious prayer to us. Um, that hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, uh, captures Hannah's faith here, I think. What, what do you do when you're suffering? You know, when your friends despise and forsake you, take it to the Lord in prayer. Um, you know, when sorrows are well, take it to the Lord in prayer. And that's what she does. And she protests uh, rightly her soberness. Um, she's not drunk at all. And she's praying out of great anguish and grief. And, and look at her praying. Think about her praying for a moment. She prays in her heart. So she's not, not making a big show of it. She's not you know, using fancy words. And she's not doing it for the attention. She prays in her heart. She knows that God hears. And, and can see her very heart she prays. She prays without pretense. She prays out of her anguish and her grief. She's honest before God. That's a, a lesson we could learn, isn't it? Sometimes we, we pray the right words that we think we ought to pray, but actually our hearts are saying something else. Well, Hannah pours out her heart. There's no pretense there. She's very honest before God. If God knows our hearts, there's no point pretending, is there? He knows anyway what we're thinking. She, and she prays earnestly and seriously. This isn't just a quick one shot, please God bless me. This is earnest prayer, serious prayer, persistent prayer. And then she makes this serious vow or promise in her praying. And it was a vow that recognised God's almighty power. Because that's the, this is the first place apparently in the Bible that uh, the, the term God almighty comes in. If you have an older Bible, it might say the Lord of hosts. And the, the thought is he is the, the God of the, of the amassed armies, of the hosts, hosts of angels. And, uh, and he, he is the head of that uh, great company. And so that's what it means. That's why our Bible translations translate it sometimes almighty. He's the one who has all power and all strength and all authority. And Hannah prays, O Lord Almighty, here. She prays recognising who she's praying to. And she makes this solemn uh, promise that if uh, God will grant her a son, she will give him back to, to the Lord. Serious prayer, a good example for us here. It's a good question to ask yourself, isn't it, often to ask ourselves. How serious really are our prayers to God? Do you pray at all? And even if you do, do you kind of just say your prayers or do you actually pray? Do you just go through the motions and say, well, I ought to? Or is there some real communion with God in your praying? Is there that faith that God can hear and answer prayer? 
Is there seriousness? Is there even tears at times? They're all to be on there. Is your heart moved? Are your affections moved? Are you honest with God? Because you can be completely honest with him who knows your heart. The, the people that pray and the prayers that they pray in the Bible are a challenging study. I mean, look through some of them and read some of the prayers and they are greatly challenging. But they're also a great example of people who, who really experience God, who really meet with him. And sometimes it's at the darkest times that, that, that those times push us to really engage with God in prayer. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord Almighty. But he's also ready to hear us and sympathise with us as we approach his throne of grace. So follow Hannah's example of serious prayer. Well, thirdly, um, Hannah, Hannah is not really the example here, but she's the recipient of God's gracious answer. So there's strong encouragement for us here to follow Hannah's example of faith. She asks for God to grant her relief from her misery and, and remember her, is how she puts it. And in other words, uh, grant her a child. And then she makes this, this astonishing promise. He will be given to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will be used on his head. And that might sound a strange uh, vow. It, it's, you know it's more than just a commitment to the style of hair that he was going to have. It, it was part of an old uh, tradition, an ancient tradition in Israel, uh, the tradition of the Nazarite vow. Um, Nazarite there doesn't mean you know from Nazareth. It, it's to do with the word for uh, being separate or consecrated. And it was a vow that an Israelite could make. You can read about it in, in, in the Old, Old Testament books. Uh, an Israelite could make for a short time for a specific purpose. If they wanted to really uh, uh, ask God for something or commit something to God, they would take this vow. They would not cut their hair. They would not drink any fermented drinks for a time. And then when the vow was fulfilled, they would shave off the hair and it, it would be offered in the temple, sort of signifying that period had come to an end. So it was a kind of temporary thing. But Hannah here is committing her son to a lifelong commitment to be, uh, to be under this Nazarite vow. Um, so she's committing, it's a serious commitment that she makes. Um, after her, her protest to Eli that she's not drunk, he seems to realise his mistake um, in giving her a telling off. And, uh, and now he believes her and he blesses her. He's the priest of God still. And he gives her good encouragement that her prayer has been heard. Uh, verse 17, he says, Go in peace, may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. Now, the text doesn't say very much more here, but I, I wonder, did, did she know at this point that God would answer her prayer with her son? I, I don't know. The text doesn't say so. But at least she had something settled about her heart and, and it lifted her spirit for sure. And I think, I think maybe that the final answer, whether she will have a son or not, is not the point here. She has left the matter with the Lord. And she's sure that he will do what is right, whether the long for child comes for or not. And Matthew Henry, the, the commentator, I was, he was very, very helpful when he said this. She had prayed for herself and Eli had prayed for her and she believed that God would either give her the mercy she'd prayed for or make up the want of it in some other way. I think that's right. The matter was settled. God, it was in God's hands and she was happy with that. And uh, Matthew Henry says, no, prayer is heart's ease to a gracious soul. Her heart's ease. Her, her, her grief was settled at that point. These days, um, these days, every every company that's worth anything has a has a number of email addresses, don't they, to help with uh, customer service kind of issues. And they're usually not the name of a person; it just says customer service at some, something or other. And if you have a problem, you send a message, and you usually get some kind of automated response. And you're never quite sure, are you, if somebody has read the message or got it or whether they care enough to help you, or whether there's even anything they can do. Now, prayer is not like that, is it? It's not like that disappointing experience of customer service. When you pray, you are approaching the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and you have access because of Jesus to God's throne, to his throne of grace. And there's no question that God has heard your prayers, and there's no question that he cares for you, and there's no question that he is able to help, that he has power to do so. Our great high priest, better than, better than Eli the high priest, our great high priest, the Lord Jesus, has, has himself come here to intercede for us with his life. And there's no question he has the power to help and uh, he's wise and good and the, the answer may be, uh, it, it may be not as you expect, but it will be in his wisdom and in his, in his uh, power. 
And it's not vain or hopeless to leave matters with God. It's actually the place that we must be. It's the place where Hannah came to. So Jesus, our great high priest, intercedes continually for us. He grants us peace. Better peace than Eli's blessing here, which was good. He grants us peace. Uh, The peace to trust him after we've poured out our hearts to him to leave the matter with him. So keep praying. Keep praying. If there's something... The Lord may not answer as you expect. He may not uh, He may not answer in the way that you've asked. But keep praying and don't be anxious for God's answer, but leave it with him and trust him in it. Well, Hannah's uh, restored composure is testimony to the fact that she is trusting God um, to hear and answer a prayer. And so the family conclude their worship and then they return home. And God, has, God has, has heard Hannah's prayer, has remembered her. And in due course, she has a son. She names him Samuel. And... You know that the the rest the next part of the story in the Bible is is going to be focused on Samuel and what he does. God uses him greatly. So here's my next point. Uh, Hannah is an example to us of costly service. Costly service. Can you imagine being in her shoes? Can you imagine longing for this child to come? The hope and uh, the desires of her heart, the years of hurt and pain, kind of rolled away because of God's answer to her prayer. But she had promised to give him back to the Lord. And that meant more, didn't it, than just dedicating his life. You know, we have our children, we say, well, Lord, we, we, we pray for them. We, Lord, take them and use them. It wasn't that. It wasn't just that. It wasn't just committing him to God. She was going to hand him over and leave him with Eli at the temple. She's going to leave him with Eli. And presumably there were other people there as well, but his two wicked and immoral sons were there as well. It was a, it, there was a certain risk involved, wasn't there, in leaving little, Eli, uh, little uh, Samuel there. She waited until he was weaned, which probably only means he was about three years old. And then she took him back to the temple and she took offerings with her, probably way more than was required uh, because of her gratitude and thanks to God. She fulfilled her vow. And there's not a hint of remorse in Hannah. She doesn't sort of begrudgingly hand him over and uh, and, uh, she does it with gratitude in her heart. Hannah is an example of joyful, uh, willing, costly service. An example to us as we live lives of faith in our God. Our, our situation is is not likely to be exactly the same as hers, but she's outworking a principle that will be that will be clearer as as you move into the New Testament as you read further. What does it cost to follow Jesus to live a life of faith in Him? Well, the answer is everything. Actually, everything it will cost. Uh, listen to uh, Jesus' words here in Luke nine. He said to them, "If anyone come after me." He must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Take up a cross and follow daily. A cross is not a minor inconvenience. It's not a minor irritation. A cross is painful and costly death. That's what it is. And Jesus says, paradoxically, the way to save your life is to lose it for Jesus, to give it up to him, all of it, to forsake any right to it, but to recognise that it's entirely his. And then, he says, you find that it's no wrench to give up at all. Um, Jesus uh, promises to bless those who take up their cross and follow him um, with something greater than all the things that we might give up. With himself, he he will come to us. And this is... uh, what, words of Jesus again come to me he says all you are weary and burdened I will give you rest take my yoke upon you learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls my yoke is easy my burden is light there is a yoke there is a an obligation but it's not a burdensome one it's not a crushing one it is a joyful one is any cost too high as you follow the Lord Jesus well that depends on how highly you value what Jesus did for you Uh, by coming and dying and rising again, I suppose. If you value that lightly, you will say, well, there are some costs that might be too much. But if you see the enormity of what he's done, well, then you would say, well, everything we have is a gift and he's given us far more than we deserve. And that changes our perspective. Even if we gave all up to the Lord Jesus, we're only giving back to him what is his by rights anyway. I was reminded of that famous uh, quote of Jim Elliot. uh, You probably know it well. He wrote in his diary in a missionary who was martyred for his faith. And uh, he said, he's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He's no fool who gives up what, what really is not his anyway, what he can't ever keep, to
to gain something that they'll never lose, to gain the Lord Jesus Christ, to gain heaven, to gain God's presence. Is there something uh, costly the Lord is requiring from you? Will you give it freely for him? You gave everything to you, for you. Will you cling to it yourself? Will, will you give it up and gladly? Well, Hannah is an example to us here too. Then, uh, last point, and um, really we could have done with a whole sermon on, um, on the last point because I want you to just have a quick look over Hannah's prayer or song in 1 Samuel 2. Um, Mary's great song in the New Testament as she prepares for the birth of Jesus has a lot, a lot of connections with Hannah's prayer here. And uh, Hannah, this may have been an existing prayer. Some people think it might have been a, a part of a song or part of a prayer that was used before, but she, she owns it. She makes it her own. And uh, she uses it to joyfully express her knowledge of God and her thanks to him for remembering her. So let me just read it to you um, just as we, we finish on this point. This is Hannah's prayer from 1 Samuel 2. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who are hungry are hungry no more. She who is barren has borne seven children, but he, she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and makes them inherit a throne of honour. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. It is a great prayer. It is a great song. And uh, it, it moves from Hannah's particular situation, from what she is experiencing, to expand into the way God often works for his people. And then it goes even further to view uh, kind of God's final and absolute rule over all creation. So this, it's, not, it's no small view of God. It's a big view of God. And she sees her life and God's dealings with her in the widest possible setting. And as I say, we haven't got time to, to do this passage justice. Um, but I, I'll put a section, I have put a section on the notes at the end um, from the commentary that I, I used a couple of times in preparation. And I think on, on chapter two, and I think you'll find the notes that are helpful. So I'll have a read of those later. But here's just one little part of, of those notes, which I think gets to the point here. Uh, and this is what Dale Ralph Davis says. The saving help Yahweh gave, gave Hannah is a foretaste, a scale model demonstration of how Yahweh will do it when he does it in grand style. Each one of Christ's flock should ingest this point into his or her thinking. Every time God lifts you out of the miry bog and sets your feet upon a rock is a sample of the coming of the kingdom of God, a down payment of the full deliverance, the macro salvation that will be yours at last. In other words, each little rescue is just a touch, just a taste of the rescue that God has won for his people in Jesus. So our eyes ought to turn always from God's help and blessing in our lives to see the great and final deliverance of all God's people that is to come. Um, all our micro salvations point to his great salvation. And they should make our hearts, hearts praise God even, even in the darkness. <clears throat> Hannah is a, an example to us of joyful song in response to what God has done. Um, has your experience of, of God stifled your praise? Uh, you know, do you find it hard to praise God at the moment? Maybe there's some circumstance in your life which is pressing on you. Well, he, here's what we learned from Hannah. Lift your eyes above, <clears throat> above the trial, above the stormy trial, whatever that is, and, and see the rock that is the Lord Jesus and cling to him. Uh, Hannah is a great example to us. She's a great encouragement that God cares for his people. He cares for you and he loves you deeply and that he's able to vindicate your faith and trust in him. It might not be to have exactly the answer to the prayer that you're praying in the way that you ask. But our great high priest always, always brings peace to our souls, that shalom, that whole peace to us 
as we trust him. So there's Hannah's example. I think it's a good one. She teaches us about godly suffering and about serious praying and about God's gracious answers and our our response, our costly service and our joyful song. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, Lord, this uh, account in your word of uh, one of your faithful servants, Hannah. And we thank you for her example in the face of such extreme pressure and uh, pain and bitterness in her life. We thank you, Lord, that she ran to you. And Lord, that she found you to be uh, her rock, her deliverance, her song. Lord, we pray that we might uh, take this example seriously, Lord, that we might think more on, uh, Lord, your dealings with Hannah and apply them to our own lives, Lord. Maybe there are circumstances that have caused us bitterness. And we pray that, Lord, they would not cause us to turn from you, but, Lord, to uh, follow even more closely, to, to come uh, closer to you, Lord, that we might uh, pour out our hearts and be honest before you. And, Lord, that you might meet with us at that time of distress. Lord, you might meet with us in a way that you've not done before. And, Father, we pray that we might uh, then in response, uh, Lord, after, after uh, turning to prayer, Lord, we might find you to be a God who is near to the brokenhearted, the one who comforts us in our sorrows. Lord, we pray that you would help us uh, in that uh, costly service, Lord, that you require of us, that we might give up all, that we might follow you. And, uh, Lord, that you might be our song, uh, the song in our hearts, Lord, and on our lips. And, uh, Lord, that you might receive all the praise that is rightfully yours. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray you'll bless it to us as we think further on it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.